Hi, Amy. Thank you so much for being on the Revital Health Podcast. I really appreciate your time. Uh, how are you today? Yes, I'm so well. Thank you, Jody. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, pleasure. Absolutely pleasure. So today we're going to be talking about a lot of um, different things in terms of environmental impacts on health. Um, plus, we're going to touch on a lot of other things in terms of um, uh, how, how to clean up, how to, to deal with those from a personal level and also a, cl a clinical level as well. But I wanted to start with just a bit of your story and how you got to this point in time for, um, you know, your history as a practitioner, as well as the, um, your health history bringing you to this point. Mm, yes, certainly. There's a lot to unpack. I know. There. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, I guess to start with, um, I've been in clinical practice now for coming up 20 years, so it's 19 this year. Oh um, I was very lucky to discover, you know, that uh, my passion very young. So I started studying very young and I started at a time where, you know, I was really able to pack a lot in to the time that I was in college. and. From there, I was very lucky to be mentored by a great practitioner and I got you know, experience in all different aspects of natural medicine. And that has really helped me grow as a clinician. But in addition to that, you know, working for a nutraceutical company and being involved in product development and research and presenting um, has also given me a huge advantage where I'm actually you know, surrounded by a team who are, have got their finger on the pulse of everything and we get to share what we uncover as individuals with the collective. So I feel very lucky, very privileged. And up until 2017, I was really spending my professional time between presenting, like, you know, professional education, presenting to mm -hmm. other practitioners, um, including nurses, pharmacists, and GPs, but primarily nutritionists, herbalists, and naturopaths, as well as seeing clients. And I actually, where this plot twist occurred was when I took a bit of a career break, actually. I stepped away from my presenting role. I actually closed the books on my business mm -hmm. and took an entire year off to focus on, you know, and we all have these projects that we sort of hope to get to one day or we're trying to chip away in our spare time and never get any traction. So I, you know, made arrangements to be able to um, afford not to work for a year, not thinking that that would actually be what happened. And um, unfortunately, you know, moved to the lovely Northern beaches into an apartment in Manly that had been renovated quite recently. And whatever they did to the bathroom was a failure and resulted in an undetectable, undetectable but very significant water leak over a period of about five months between when I moved in there and then when we actually discovered what was really going on. And in that period of time, I almost lost everything, including my ability to remember my own name, to speak, to figure out how to put clothes on, get dressed in the morning, function, sleep, walk, eat, anything. It was an absolute disaster. And that was, yeah, single-handedly the worst year of my life. Um, mm -hmm. However, every cloud has a silver lining. And one of the blessings that came out of that experience was, was probably two things. Number one, I realized that no matter what we have in our toolkit as practitioners, nutrients, herbs, all the cool things that we have, none of it can outdo a toxic environment. Mm. None of it. And I'd never been in such a toxic environment to ever have that direct experience. And so that put into sharp relief for me that that is something that we have to be looking at for all of our patients. Um, but yeah, in addition to that, it was a real eye opener for me when we as clinicians are always looking for the root cause of disease and dealing with that. And it was more a, an awakening about the cause of the cause and actually looking behind the first presenting cause as to the true underlying driver of that. And I realized, you know, there was this huge gap between what we're taught as functional medicine practitioners and environmental health. Most of us are aware to a degree 
you know, artificial electromagnetic radiation isn't great and mm. we should be a little wary about devices, especially wireless devices. And most of us know, you know, toxins in our water and food are problematic, but particularly when it comes to water damaged buildings and the cesspool that they are of toxicants and microorganisms, mm. it was just an absolute blind spot for me. And since then I've, I've, I've realized it's, it wasn't just me, most physicians and practitioners are just utterly unaware and in fact don't ask even questions that might even accidentally elucidate what's going on in someone's home so yeah my personal mission now has shifted um, the year that I took off I was actually intending to do a lot of work around um, acne and the real the root causes of chronic skin disorders and um, and of course now I've just I can't unsee what I've seen and I need to fill in the gap for it for everybody because there are an awful lot of people suffering unnecessarily and if they have the means to do so we're actually spending a lot of money on things that aren't going to make a difference ultimately mm. and they just don't know yet Absolutely. And it's so invisible, isn't it? Um, and that's, that's the key. A lot of other things are invisible within the body, but we have a sense of feeling them. But this sort of thing, it can present itself in so many different ways for, for different people, kind of. And I find that's a really tricky one to, to look at. Yeah. Yeah, it, it really is. I mean, what we do is is quite sophisticated detective work anyway. Mm, I've seen you and, in all your yeah. masks and <laughs> get up as well. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I well, it. I mean, it's the same sort of thing, but in a home. But mm. like you said, um, with regards to a lot of the things in a building, whether that's our home or our workspace or even our car or the public transport we ride in, we can't see bacteria, we can't see viruses, we can't see mould until the overgrowth is very extensive. Mm. We can't see electromagnetic radiation. If we could, we would be absolutely panicked out of our brain mm -hmm. um, and we also can't see you know the chemicals and toxicants in the furnishings and building materials either so you know the, the saying ignorance is bliss I understand where it comes from but the truth couldn't be further from that and mm -hmm. devastating to think that it's a bit like asbestos and cigarette smoking these things have a long latency period which is why they can be so hard to pick up yeah. And what I'm seeing now is people, you know, have been in a water damaged building or perhaps been sleeping on the other side of a, a smart meter, you know, 10, 15, sometimes 20 years later being um, diagnosed or, um, you know, with a disease that was absolutely preventable mm. if they were able to avoid that constant triggering um, yeah. over that period of time. Mm. So I, I tend to refer to my clients in, in a sort of a glass half full or a glass full scenario where, you know, you, you go about your day and you feel, you're filling your cup up, you know, it, it gets filled, it gets filled, it gets filled. Because you know, I get a lot of questions saying, well, why is that person responding to it? And I'm, well, how, how, how are they okay and I'm not okay? And I, mm. I tend to explain it in a way that, um, you know, they fill their cup up and their toxic ability for metabolizing that out or getting rid of that or just specific ways of dealing with it in their body is, is um, different to the person next to them. Um, yes. And, you know, you need to sort of empty that off or you need to take your, yourself away from that environment to then empty that cup a little bit so your body can get back to normal function. So yes. how do you explain it to people? I'm really interested to... To hear yes. it. <laughs> so there's a couple of things that I like to make clear for anyone mm. asking that question. And one of them is no one is immune to the effects of these environmental toxicants. It's just a matter of how quickly the damage is going to show up for you. So using mold as an example, you know, mycotoxins are going to damage everybody's brain. They're going to damage everybody's kidneys. They're going to damage everybody's liver. But there are a portion of the population, you know, depends on what you're looking at, but 25 to 33% who cannot metabolize mycotoxins as efficiently as the rest of the population. Mm. And so what that means is, um, you know, again, it's, it's a bit like asking the question of, you know, 
there's that small population of people who smoke cigarettes who never seem to get lung cancer. That doesn't change the fact that cigarettes are bad for you. They cause lots of health problems and are likely to lead to, to lung cancer. Mm. And so with the population who can't metabolize and they, they get sicker quicker, much quicker. And so, you know, as far as filling up the glass goes, it fills up very rapidly and it's almost physiologically impossible to empty it. Mm. And then at that point, Point, they develop multiple chemical sensitivity that's usually when emf sensitivity kicks in now we actually know physiologically speaking everybody's body responds to electromagnetic radiation in a negative manner but when you just become so full of toxins and so inflamed you actually start to feel the subtle shifts of when inflammatory processes rise and that's when people, you know, will say they feel sick with their phone too close or they can't sleep near the power outlet or things like that. You know, their body has just become this finely tuned and incredibly inflamed instrument. And mm. what really helped me shift this for myself, so for anyone listening who is mold susceptible, like I am, when it first happened to me, it was absolutely devastating and the cost i can't even begin to count the cost financially emotionally physically my whole life trajectory um but and of course understandably as a result because of that you know for a period of time i felt very resentful and very sad and distressed that i happened to have gotten these dud genes so to speak <laughs> Um, you know, it still affects me today where, um, you know, I can't go to see a movie at a cinema because they're all moldy. If I'm invited to dinner um, for a friend's birthday, I have to go and actually check the restaurant first to see whether or not it's going to be safe for me. Mm. Um, you know, I travel a lot, staying in a hotel overnight that's bad could, you know, put me in bed for up to six weeks on occasion. So, you know, for anyone feeling the same way, it's totally understandable to think this really blows and mm. why me or mm. me. And um, with, with that being said, though, I really like um, Dave Asprey's uh, approach. And he said, you know, he's really grateful that his body is finely tuned to environmental toxicants. And he's grateful that his body lets him know when a place is poisonous and to be honest, I know it's a real struggle for families when, you know, not everyone's sick and there are big decisions to be made to recover. But to be honest, you know, that person's body's warning you, you're all going to eventually go down with what's happening in this house. It's just their body is the, the canary in the mine shaft, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everyone's going to benefit from listening to that and responding quickly. So, um, I now 99% of the time feel positive about the fact that my body responds badly to water damaged buildings and toxic environments. And I just see that as an opportunity to get myself somewhere healthier, quicker, instead of obliviously inhaling and ingesting and absorbing things that are ultimately doing my organs damage. Mm. So since that exposure, when you say that that's what happened when you went into that building, before yes. that time, would you have felt that stick to it? Um, well, so more. Yes, not as sensitively. I think we're very distracted these mm. days. There's an awful lot of things um, going on that our senses are taking in, and if you're unaware of what to look for, smell for, feel for. It's very easy to miss um, a lot of the early warning signs, although. I will say, having been through that very extreme exposure, it is very much a case of my body's reaction is much stronger and more obvious now than it ever was. Having said that, I've had these genes my whole life. And when I look back on all of the different places that I've lived and some weird symptoms that doctors could not explain at mm -hmm. the time it all now makes perfect sense so i used to get blood noses um, in a particular home and i know that was a, a poorly built poorly insulated military house in the middle of a desert that was very damp and my bedroom was on the south wall 
And, you know, in addition to that, you know, I used to get lots of muscle cramps. I'd get numb hands and feet. I had horrific, violent nightmares as a kid. Um, there were lots. I mean, I have a laundry list of things. I would have my thyroid would actually swell up, but it never got to the point where um, they detected anything. Although I understand now that's because they also were not testing for the right thing yeah. either. But, you know, it would be swollen to the point where I felt like I was choking. And then, and I had, I had this real claustrophobia about anything up around my neck and then it would subside again. And so now I'm like, oh, this all just makes perfect sense. And to be honest, it's actually quite a relief. It was a relief for me. Mm -hmm. And I know for many clients, it's a relief for them also to finally have answers when they've actually been, you know, either best case scenario left neglected and, and unassisted by mm -hmm. the medical professionals they see or in worst case scenario, really mistreated, misdiagnosed with psychiatric conditions or dismissed as a hypochondriac or so, you know, someone who's making it up. So mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's definitely something in hindsight I recognize was going on for me to a degree. I just yeah. never twigged, you know, I just mm -hmm. never twigged. Yeah. Wow. That's a, um, <laughs> it's a big thing um, that we need to be considering and, and, I'm realizing this more and more, um, you know, as the months go on and even more clients that I'm seeing coming in and there's, there's just these certain things that you look at and you're like, oh my goodness, that's, that's so important to be picking up. And that, that really rings true there. So yeah. let's just dive into, into um, what we need to be looking out for and how okay. physiologically that can impact us. And we've gone through a lot of those symptoms already, which is fantastic. But yes, give yeah. me a little bit more detail into um, how it can look for our bodies as well as um, what, what we're looking out for. So with regards to mould and water-damaged um, buildings, there are sort of a few categories of symptoms. The most common symptoms that people will experience look like hay fever or allergies. So when mold is sporulating or even if it's dying and drying out and there's fragments being released into the air, it acts very much like pollen does to someone who gets allergic rhinitis to mm. that particular particulate. So it could be taking antihistamines constantly mm -hmm. um, or simply just chronically on and off, itchy nose, runny nose, watery eyes, itchy throat, um, asthma is a big mm -hmm. one. The Environmental Protection Agency estimate that about 80% of all asthmatics are actually triggered by um, mold. Wow. Um, yeah, big time. Um, also, um, wait, even waking up with, you know, little crusts in your eye, that's a sign your body's trying to flush some sort of irritant out of your eyeballs. Um, and also, in a water damaged building, as soon as you add water, everything that has the potential for life comes to life. And so that includes every bacteria or virus that's ever been shed into mm. that property. Wow. And so like, an, I know it's disgusting when you mm. think about it. Um, <laughs> and this is why I'll never live with carpet again. This is why I only choose hotels that don't have carpet because that's an archeological dig site for every human that's ever been in that room, all of their dead skin cells, viruses, bacteria, fungi. It's honestly revolting. So oh. we'll move on. But <laughs> what that means is mold is actually just the visible proxy for all of the microbes in that building. And so as they're all coming to life, you get chronic infections happening. So usually that's respiratory tract. So chronic sinusitis, getting colds or flu-like symptoms just over and over and over again, chronic bronchitis or chest infections um, are really common things if there's a, a significant water leak. Mm -hmm. Now, in addition to that, you've got all of the problems that the mycotoxins can cause. Now, when you've got bacteria and fungi and viruses competing for food and water, they start to produce chemicals to kill each other. Now, the most famous mycotoxin we know of is penicillin, which is an antibiotic. And many mycotoxins are antibacterial antibiotics. So we see very commonly digestive disturbances in people who are living in water damaged buildings because they're essentially swallowing constantly antibiotics that are destroying their microbiome. So 
food intolerances start to rise. We start to see IBS-like symptoms. And in fact, loss of bowel control is sort of, um, uh, I guess, further down the timeline of that. Um, but yes, diarrhea and explosive diarrhea are a really big thing there. Not everyone gets it, of course, again, but mm. common things, food intolerances, gut microbiome problems and leaky gut. And then you've got the neurotoxic, hepatotoxic, um, nephrotoxic chemicals that can cause organ damage. So you might see elevated liver enzymes or weird things happening with the kidneys, but there's no other reason mm. why that's happening or you start to see neurocognitive issues. So changes in memory, um, mood is another really big one, um, and just general fine motor control and cognitive function. The other big flag, red flag is the um, chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. Most of the time, they are just simply names for a collection of symptoms that are being triggered by a water damage building. Now, certainly there can be other causes for those two conditions, but what I'm finding of most of the time is it's a water damage building that hasn't been either identified or addressed properly. Wow. So this, this is why it's so yeah. easy to miss. Um, especially if you get a diagnosis, you're diagnosed with asthma or you've suddenly developed adult onset asthma. I mean, that's really suspicious, but um, you know, why is that the case? Or why is it all of a sudden your liver enzymes are going out when nothing else has changed for you? Or why have you developed chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia now? You know, what is the cause of that? And I think um, what frustrates me is a lot of people sort of stop there and go, oh, well, I've got fibromyalgia that's that. What can you use to treat fibromyalgia instead of also going, well, what are the causes and can I get rid of them as mm. well? Mm, absolutely. <clears throat> it has to be multi, multifaceted <laughs> approach. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> wow. All right. So I, I didn't, I didn't know some of that. So that's really interesting, really interesting and a really good way of looking at it from a point of view that they're fighting off each other and that's the toxicants that are coming out of those and then harming us. Hmm. Yes, Very absolutely. And that's not even looking at the bacterial LPS, um, you know, the endotoxin that they're producing and all of that stuff. So that's a lot. It's a chemical and microbial suit. I guess the last thing I just want to throw in there is that as the mold begins to break down the furnishing, so it eats into the gyp rock, eats into your carpet, it's aerosolizing all of the chemicals that went into making hmm. those materials. So formaldehyde, um, all the glues, the resins, the dyes, the heavy metals. Um, and as they're digesting this food, they are... Professor Mark Cohen calls them fungi farts. They might be producing <laughs> microbial... <laughs> VOCs, and this is what gives that classic mold smell. In fact, there's lots of classic mold smells, um, and we can talk about that in a minute. But mm. these VOCs are also very toxic, potentially carcinogenic chemicals that you're inhaling and absorbing through your skin. So you're literally being poisoned by chemicals, heavy metals, as well as having microbial challenges and their toxins as well. Wow. So, <laughs> oh, it's a bit down and dance. We'll have to lighten the mood again at the end, like yes, what we yes, can actually we do. <laughs> yes, there are things you can do. Don't panic. Yeah, it's so funny. Every time I talk this topic, I'm like, oh boy, oh boy. You know, even in your own circumstances, you're thinking all these things. Um, so, yeah, let's talk, let's talk more of those mold smells. I would love to just yes. touch on that quickly. Yes. Okay. So a healthy home shouldn't smell like anything. Mm -hmm. It should smell just fresh and odorless. Anytime there's a smell, there's a problem. Okay. So I think probably most importantly, people need to pop that in their mind. So there could be sort of a, that one room that has its own special little aroma. That's a red flag. Um, but they've got the classic mold smell that people um, associate with mustiness or moldiness. But depending on what species and strain of mold it is and what it's growing on and how much water it's got, it can produce smells that smell like cat urine, bleach, fermenting mushrooms, alcohol, marijuana, uh, vomit, dirty socks. <laughs> None of it's nice, by the way. Wow. Um, yeah. And then, of course, you, you know, you've always got multiple species going on. So there's just this, just this whole symphony of... 
oh. aromas um, happening. And so when, you know, when mold gets very heavy, it's, it's very repellent, but even a small amount as it's actively growing can produce quite um, an odor. And if you are smelling anything that tells you there is active mold growth, which means there is an active moisture problem. And so you have to find the source of the moisture before you can do anything else actually. Mm. And that I think is probably one of the big oversights that people commit most of the time. Their immediate thing is, oh gosh, I've got to clean that out or I've got to throw that out. And they kind of stop there. When in actual fact, you need to find the problem, the source of the problem, which is the source of the moisture. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it'll just simply keep coming back. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we'll talk about how to do that, um, of course, in this time together. But, yeah, any weird smell is a big red flag. Okay. And even sensitivity to, to smells, do you find people who are more sensitive, they will smell it more than others in the house? Yes, yes. Mm. As, a, as a form of self-preservation, I think that multiple chemical sensitivity people develop, it's partly because their glass is full and mm -hmm. there's just no room yeah. for their body to take any more in and, and the body freaks out. But at the same time, that sense of smell becomes extremely heightened. Your, you know, your external surfaces here are on the lookout to prevent anything further coming in because it knows mm. you're in big trouble already so anyone who is quite sensitive to any smell so whether that's fragrances or you know the laundry aisle at the supermarket or petrol gives them a headache um, all of those things and more that is definitely a red flag that your your toxicant glasses overflowing probably oh, yeah. or very very full um, and then again you've got to look for the source of well why am I so overloaded and burdened and water damage building and of course all of the stuff that comes with it is unfortunately a very common one and mm. people usually miss it mm. okay and so what we're what we're dealing with there is obviously a lot of liver because that's where a lot of the metabolism happens or the you know yeah. detoxification happens and then there's the gene yeah. component as well yeah Yes. Yeah. Well, the genes, the gene drives the ability of the liver to clear the mm, toxins mm. and essentially just looking at the way the immune system works, you know, we've got sort of two halves. You've got the innate immune system, which are, you know, I guess all brawn, no brains, <laughs> if you like, yeah. you're kind of the first responders when our, there's something the army. in our body. Yeah, they're the army. They're the ones that the hillbillies that show up with all guns blazing and they don't care if there's, you know, shrapnel flying. And then you've got the more sophisticated um, soldiers that, you know, a little bit more finesse who can then actually recognise what's wrong and clear that very specific thing without damaging anything else. Now, the way the genetic um, disability, if you want to call it that, plays out is that the set, like the backup team never arrive. Mm -hmm. And if they do, they are just bumbling and incompetent. Yeah. And so you're left with the aggressive, violent immune response being chronically triggered and it never hands over the baton to the other part of the immune system to then wrap things up. And so it's part you can't clear the mycotoxins properly through mm -hmm. the liver mm -hmm. and part the inflammation keeps getting triggered. So that's sort of two key areas that, you need to focus on to be able to help someone heal. Of course, that can only be done though once they are out of harm's way. Exactly. Yeah. And that's probably the hardest part, isn't it? Really to try and get people oh. removed from that environment because people don't want to give up their homes or move out or remedy it because it is a lot of, a lot of money generally to get those things remedied as well. Yes. But we'll go into that in a minute. <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> so what sort of impact does this have on aging? Um, and particularly, even if you want to talk mitochondria as well. Yes. Yeah. It causes a dramatic acceleration in aging. And I think um, that is one of the hallmarks that we see in those who are genetically susceptible. They'll tell you um, that they just look and feel like they're 80 mm -hmm. and they will have, you know, there are subtle things that perhaps someone else wouldn't pick up on a photo. For me, it's the swollen face. It's that my eyes disappear into my head when I smile because I'm so puffy. And if I was to show someone sort of a before and after smiling picture, they probably couldn't pick quite those things mm -hmm. necessarily. But the aging component of it is um, a lot more readily 
witnessed. And so you see a dramatic increase in externally, you see a dramatic increase in fine lines, you see a dramatic increase in age spots, um, sagging skin, we see connective tissue breaking down at an accelerated rate. So we see more sprains, injuries, varicose veins, saggy skin, loss of muscle tone. Uh, but internally speaking, Obviously toxins are problematic for all cells and that has an impact on mitochondria, mm. but the inflammatory cytokines that are produced, I think are even more significant and that really knocks mitochondria around. And I guess to, so mitochondria for anyone who's listening, who listens to your podcast or knows what you do, they probably already know what mitochondria <laughs> are and what they do, but for anyone who's hearing that term for the first time, you know, they're the little, essentially the engine cell of our room that produces energy and every single one of our cells needs energy to do its job. So our liver needs energy to detoxify stuff and so on and so forth. Now for every unit of, let's say glucose, um, our mitochondria, when we're healthy, can produce, you know, 38 to 40 units of ATP. Now, ATP is just the sciencey word for energy. It's a chemical we measure energy production with. Someone affected by mold, their mitochondria becomes so damaged, they can only produce two units of ATP. Wow. with the same amount and that's where the chronic fatigue comes from that's mm. where the muscle pain comes from because the lactic acid is building up because that whole energy cycle isn't working properly and so um, this is also where the term spoony comes from I actually didn't know this term prior to becoming unwell but it's a term often Lyme patients will use although chronic fatigue sufferers mm. um, myalgic encephalitis sufferers will do and have you heard that term Jodie? No I haven't actually. No, okay uh, you know, it was such a gift when I when I finally worked out what it was because yeah. it was invented as in by spoon. As an, I, I'm a spoonie, yeah, yeah. As an as, as an a spoon, I'll explain what it means. Okay. Um, this blogger with I think she has chronic fatigue. She invented this as a way of explaining to people just how impacted she was energetically speaking. And what she, how she describes it is most normal people, normal healthy people wake up in the morning with a full drawer of spoons and spoons are representative of units of energy or how much energy you have. And so let's say it costs you a spoon to shower. It costs you a spoon to decide what to wear today. It costs you a spoon to do your makeup and it costs you a spoon to do your hair. And then it costs you a spoon, spoon to make your breakfast, another one to clean up, another one to drive to work. You spend 20 or 30 at work, you spend five at the gym, and then you, you, know, you do it all again in the evening with cooking, cleaning, and life activities. Mm. And most people can get through their day just you know, spending spoons <laughs> you know, <laughs> anywhere, and they still have a few left over, or yeah. they get to the end of the day and they can do everything they want and everything they need and haven't run out of spoons. At the height or perhaps the depths of my illness, I had one or two spoons and I had to make the decision every day about whether I ate or showered. And so, you know, my husband, now husband was, you know, had to go to work because I couldn't work. Um, and if he didn't fix me breakfast, some days I wouldn't eat until he came home oh for dinner goodness. because I didn't have the energy to get out of bed to make food, let alone shower. And um, yeah, and that's not even with the memory problems aside, forgetting to eat, forgetting if I did eat um, wow. and those sorts of things. So to, so, you know, that was just a really nice analogy for that she created to explain to people, I'm sorry, I, you know, I can't come out to your lunch because I don't even have the energy to brush my teeth today, mm. you know, and sometimes I'll even say that to my husband, he'll he might want to go for a, a walk after work. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't have the spoons for that. You know? <laughs> so I'm having a, a low spoon way. day. Yeah, low spoon day. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So those dealing with that would wake up with a lot less spoons, would only have their, you know, one or two or even three sometimes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Like, and that impacts how you show up mood-wise. This, this is why it can be so taxing on relationships and partnerships and, of course, your employment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, anyone who's never experienced this can still probably appreciate, if you've had a couple of nights of bad sleep, mm -hmm. just how much that impacts your ability to, to be your normal, healthy, happy self, right? Absolutely. And that's what some people are dealing with on a day-to-day on a -day basis. 
My goodness. Yeah. The only thing I could um, liken it to in my life is when I was pregnant and having morning sickness, the, the, the two times yep. that I did. And it was well, the t- for my both my kids and it was awful. It was awful. It was like that. You just mm. cannot get out of bed in the morning. And that's just a mm. horrible yeah. way of living. Hugely impactful. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So, um, you know, talking about the mould and the environment, we'll, we'll bring on to, um, you know, how, how to deal with that and even testing it in a minute. But talk to me more about EMF. And I know that's a massive passion of yours. Yes. Oh, Tell me about sure how is. that affects our body and where we should be focused on that. So artificial radiation, electromagnetic mm-hmm. radiation, mm-hmm. has increased in the last 100 years a quintillion fold. Mm. And you have to really write down the zeros to yeah. appreciate that that is huge. <laughs> it's really huge. And there is just no way we would have let it get to this point if that pollution was visible. Mm. I want you to think of Beijing on a bad day times 10. Mm. We wouldn't live in it. We wouldn't stand for it. We would make immediate changes to industry that were contributing to that. Or we would simply leave leave that city and go yeah. somewhere healthier. But unfortunately, electromagnetic radiation for the most part, apart from visible light, which is of course a natural form, we cannot see it. So if we're not using a meter and a meter specific to the type of EMR we're trying to measure, because there are six different kinds, mm-hmm. um, you'll have really no idea that it's there. Now, rightfully so, anyone concerned about 5G really should be. Mm -hmm. And anyone not concerned about 5G doesn't understand the impact of the current electromagnetic pollution that we have Mm -hmm. and get across that first. Although I want to say we're at this tipping point where the high frequencies haven't even been sold and started to be used yet. Unfortunately, there are 5G satellites already in space, but, you know, there's meant to be 20,000 more going up soon. We, We are at a time where we can stop it. But prior to those being launched and prior to 5G being turned on and activated everywhere, currently the largest exposure we're experiencing is actually from inside our own homes. Mm. And we can actually reduce our EMR exposure by about 85% or more, depending on what your current exposure is like elsewhere, just by changing things inside our house. And that's Mm -hmm. a really significant um, and powerful position. To it's be positive. In. Yeah, it's really positive. Um, I would also, you know, highly recommend people actually, you know, take action to get 5G stopped. But for the time being, there's, you know, it's about a hundred things you can do in your home that can dramatically reduce your exposure. And the reason you want to do that is if you haven't developed sensitivity to it yet and therefore get symptoms of electro hypersensitivity, you will be unaware of the damage that it's doing to your body. So there's a number of mechanisms of action that are unfolding when we're exposing ourselves to various types of electromagnetic radiation. And I think probably the most significant one to talk about is wireless because Mm -hmm. that's the one that's increasing all the time. All of our smart devices, Bluetooth devices, Um, everything that runs wirelessly in some way, shape or form is pumping out wireless radiation. So um, what that does is it damages the blood brain barrier. It damages the gastrointestinal barrier. It causes huge amounts of free radical damage in our cells, but especially the ones that are rapidly dividing, um, which include the ovaries and testicles. So it causes fertility Mm. problems and birth defects and other um, challenges in children that are born to mothers or fathers that have been irradiating (laughs) their gonads, so to speak, um, or exposing them whilst they were in utero. Mm. Um, It causes a loss of melatonin. And most people are familiar with melatonin as our sleep hormone. So of course we have insomnia and other hormonal um, consequences, but we also know that melatonin is one of the most powerful antioxidants and anti-cancer agents that we Mm. have. And the minute that that drops, we increase our risk for all of those things in probably, I can't really overstate how significant that is. But again, it's um, it's like smoking cigarettes, a couple of cigarettes today. And over the next few months, 
is that a big deal? It's not great, but you know, smoking a pack a day for 20 years, this is what we're looking at. You know, mm. people who've had a cell phone in their teens, their risk of brain tumors is a lot higher. We see um, people who use their cell phones against their head every year, their risk of brain cancer goes up another 8%. And so, you know, it's, um, it's a really significant invisible toxin that is mm -hmm. damaging our cells. And one of the reasons why it's kind of been lumped into this category of it's, it's harmless is because it's not in the same category as ionizing radiation. So I just want to touch on that for a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can divide all radiation into two sort of major categories, ionizing and non-ionizing. And when people hear the word radiation, they tend to only think of ionizing radiation as in nuclear power plants, Chernobyl disaster, x-rays. This is why, you know, you're mm -hmm. given a lead apron or the dentist goes behind a lead lined wall before they click the x-ray machine. Um, those have such high energy, those forms of radiation that they can instantly damage DNA. But because of that, wrongly so, non-ionizing radiation has been considered to be unable to do that to our DNA. Mm. Now, in the last sort of, what is it? How long ago was 1996? 24 years ago. <laughs> this is when, when the one and only safety test on cell phones was done, by the way. And don't really? get me started on how dumb that <sighs> test was. We should talk about that, actually, because I think people assume there are safety standards and industry standards are based on that. But anyway... Yeah. Um, you know, this, the standards were sort of settled or signed off on in 1998. Mm. Since then, in the last 22 years, science has actually elucidated a lot of mechanisms of action for damage in our body for non-ionizing radiation, mm -hmm. including that it causes single and double-stranded DNA breaks. Wow. And so whilst it requires more exposure over an extended, more extended period of time and more, I guess, more power, Mm -hmm. um, it still happens and we're just adding and adding and adding to the electromagnetic pollution in our environment. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, we already know that the closer you live to a cell phone tower, the higher your risk of cancer, the more headaches you're going to get, the more mood disorders you're going to have, the more immunosuppression you're going to have. Um, you know, there's, it is just so negligent to continue to maintain the position that non-ionizing radiation is harmless when the evidence is there and the evidence is another tricky area because mm -hmm. when you look at uh, the papers that say it's harmless of the two and a half thousand I've looked at mm -hmm. every single one of them except one has been funded by a telco company <laughs> wow and the and the one that I can't I just can't find who funded it so you know if, you, if I was a betting woman <laughs> probably was a telco, you know, an industry funded study. And it's, you know, we've seen where that goes horribly wrong in other industries. So mm -hmm. you've got to look at independent research, people that are um, not invested in the outcome either way and who are designing studies properly. And I guess that helps me circle back around to the way in which cell phones were tested for safety. Mm -hmm. Do you want to hear how bad that was? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. So for anyone who sees the hashtag, um, we are not Sam going around, this is a specific hashtag in protest to the way they tested cell phones. So they, first of all, they tested it in a laboratory environment. And I understand you've got to start somewhere and you've got mm -hmm. to remove confounding factors, but we don't live in a laboratory <laughs> concrete bunker where there is absolutely no other wireless radiation. But for argument's sake, let's say cool in the context of that, whatever the outcome is, is in the context of that. But what they've done is they had a yoke that sat on the shoulders and they popped the, the cell phone here at a 15 degree angle that was several inches away from the head. Now, I don't know, how many people do you see walking around talking like this? Most people mm -hmm. talk like this yeah. unless they know better, right? Yeah. Maybe occasionally like this, but it was set, set here for six minutes. Now, especially now because everyone's maintaining physical distance and staying mm -hmm. home as much as possible, the only way we connect, can connect with people, probably talking more, but even pre-isolation, mm -hmm. six conversations usually go for more than six minutes. Absolutely. Okay, so the safety standard is based on keeping your conversation under six minutes and holding your phone like this. However, mm -hmm. this is where things get really wacky. 
they tested it on a plastic head that was full of salt, sugar, and water. How is that remotely relevant to a human brain? Are you serious? No, I'm not kidding. I'm deadly serious. That is the extent of cell phone safety testing. That's the what they've absolute done. absolute extent. That's it. That is it. That is it. And can I tell you, the industry standards for telecommunications devices aren't even based on that feeble and ridiculous and unscientific safety test, but that is the extent of the safety testing the telco industry have bothered doing and publishing. Now, there's a whole host about that that is just entirely laughable. But what they were trying to test for was the SAR. You'll see the SAR rating or the SAR rating on devices. And it's essentially mm. pointing to the thermal effect. Did it heat the tissue up? And we know obviously, you know, microwaving our tissue is going to cause some problems. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. did it raise the, you know, the water, salt and sugar by a degree in that six minutes? So honestly, it's utterly ridiculous, um, which is why you've got to look elsewhere for the evidence of the impact yeah. that these things have. And look, I understand that my, my thoughts on it are this. Mm. No one's going to give up their cell phones. I'm not giving up my cell phone. But if people knew the things that uh, these actually do when we use them for an extended period of time near our bodies or if we're sitting near our, you know, our Wi-Fi modem, we would use them very differently mm -hmm. in a much safer manner and that would dramatically decrease the risks that we're currently facing with the way that we're using them. Yeah. So what, what do we do then? What, what's your recommendations? I've got, you know, under my belt, I would say... Um, you know, depending on what you, what is feasible, you know, in terms of research, there, there is not much done on that because it's the way that the energy is received by the body rather than the electrometer. You know, that's sort of my understanding of it. Um, you know, you've got the, the, the earphones that are specifically the air, not the AirPods, the, um, I always say them the wrong one. The air tube, air tube. Air tubes. Don't do the AirPods. The no AirPods. AirPods. <laughs> That's like frying in your brain. Yes. Um, the air tubes, um, you know, there's some people that have the, the obviously the immediate plugins. I've got one in now, you know, straight into your computer for the internet. Um, yes. obviously putting your um, phone on airplane at night, if you are going to need your phone on and turning your Wi-Fi off in the house. Now, yes. what else is there? What, what can we do? What is sort of things that you recommend? So with the turning the Wi-Fi off at night, first of all, you can get a very cheap um, EMF meter that checks for electric fields, magnetic fields, and wireless radiation. And I can send you the link um, for anyone who wants to actually test. Okay, um, cool. But I... But if you have one of these, some people might discover that turning their Wi-Fi off at night doesn't actually turn the Wi-Fi off, only their signal. Um, mm -hmm. As far as Wi-Fi modems go, almost all of them have a second signal for free public use and switching them off. And sometimes even turning the electricity off at the wall is not enough to stop really? them transmitting. Yes. Mm. So if you don't have a meter, you don't plan to buy one and you don't plan to get an EMF testing technician or building biologist to come and check, unplug it from the wall when you're right. not using it. Mm -hmm. um, don't sit anywhere near it. You can also get it powered down. So mm -hmm. Wi-Fi modems were originally a business tool. And obviously you've got corporate offices, you've got concrete building blocks. So this, the signal that comes out of, you know, the Wi-Fi modem as you get it out of the box is very, very strong, way stronger than you need it to be at home. You can actually log into your ISP's settings and power it down by 95% and still get a perfectly adequate signal at home for all of your streaming, um, gaming, <laughs> internet surfing needs, but reduce your exposure while it's on by 95%. Mm. Wow. Um, and it, yeah. And of course, stay as far away from it as possible too, yeah. whilst it's on. The same applies to wireless, anything else wireless, like wireless TVs or wireless speakers. Mm -hmm. um, I have a sound bar that even when the um, switch is off at the wall is still transmitting a wireless Hmm. Um, signal so I have to pull that out of the wall and there are some wireless speakers that are completely cordless same even when they're off um, I, call, I found out a colleague of mine another building biologist 
has to put hers in a stainless steel pot at night because it, there's just no way to turn it off. Can't control um, it. You can't control it. So <sighs> be very mindful of that stuff. Um, wow. A couple of other tips on wireless. Don't ever use your cell phone when you offer a call um, or really anything if you've got less than all four bars or a full signal because the weaker the signal, the more radiation it emits trying to establish a signal. It can actually emit up to 10,000 times more radiation um, if you do oh that. Um, so the same applies when talking on your phone, uh, driving in the car. And I hate to say that because I know often that's the only chance people get to either talk to people or clear their messages. Um, but the truth is, as the cell phone keeps trying to find the nearest cell tower, it's emitting a lot more radiation. And then the metal in your car is actually amplifying that back onto you. Wow. So if, yeah. if you're doing that regularly, you're just microwaving yourself. Mm. Um, what else can I say? Yeah, probably the other main things are, that's wireless radiation. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe the other thing I could suggest is you can put your phone back on 3G um, through the really? settings. Yes, you can, which reduces its um, radiation emissions. And you can also do little things like um, setting your emails, if you have email on your phone, to fetch manually. So it's not constantly refreshing in the background and, and reconnecting all the time. So flight mode definitely makes a significant difference. But... It is actually always connected. You might notice if you ever open the maps, the satellite can actually still track where you are through your phone, even with flight mode on. So right. it's very weak. Um, but what that means is if you're using your phone for an alarm, which I do, you need to either have it in the like in the outside the bedroom door or mm -hmm. as far away as possible from you, mm -hmm. um, not by your bedside table, not under your pillow ever, ever, ever. Um, but they're probably the main ones. And of course, wireless headphones, just please avoid them like mm. plague. And the air tubes are obviously ideal because they, you know, the signal, it's actually just plastic all the way from here. Um, you can get shielded clothing. Um, yeah, I've seen that. There's quite a lot more yeah, coming out now. There is. There's also a lot of stuff and gimmicks coming out that don't do anything. Yeah. And none of it is a substitute for reducing how long you're on wireless devices and increasing the distance. But mm -hmm. I work, I work at the computer all day long and all night long at the moment because I'm studying yeah. and seeing clients. And so this is actually a, um, a singlet that ha has silver thread in it. And I'm not wearing it right now. I just, I've got it on my lap covering my ovaries, but um, as the weather cools down, I'll wear it under my clothing um, to at least protect my torso and my mm. major organs with the exception of my brain. But Radia Shield is the only fabric um, that I have investigated and that their testing stands up. So anything made out of Radia Shield, I can recommend. And so okay. if you have a business where you're sitting in front of, this is only wireless radiation, by the way, it doesn't protect against any other type, but you know, for everything running on the internet and, mm -hmm. and on cellular data, it's good. Okay. So then I guess the one couple of other things to be mindful of are the electromagnetic fields produced by the wiring and the devices in your home appliances, mm. I should say. So every, everywhere there is um, current running in your wall. So all of the electrical wiring, there is an electromagnetic field being produced. So you don't really want to sit or even have your head up against walls because you're likely to be putting your head in the electromagnetic field. But more importantly, things like um, bedside lamps and alarm clocks that run on electricity or wireless for that matter, but for EMF fields, they are actually producing EMF fields often even when they're turned off. So again, you've got to pull them out from the wall. It's not enough mm -hmm. to flick the lamp off or even flick the, um, the actual power switch off. Really? And wow. yeah. So any, the bigger the appliance, the more electricity it uses, the bigger the EMF field it's going to produce. And this matters when you consider the position of beds in a home. Mm -hmm. So if your bedroom is up against the kitchen and on the other side of the wall, you have the oven, mm. microwave, the kettle, the fridge, you know, there's going to be a huge electromagnetic field coming through that wall. And so you should move your bed to the other side and put your head as far away as possible. Yeah. Um, the same goes for smart meters, especially because of the wireless radiation they're producing. Absolutely. Um, 
smart TVs, induction stovetops are the worst. So mm. you don't really want to be standing with your hips up against your bench as you slow cook something on the top, if that's what you're using. So the there's gas. a lot to consider. Yeah, go the gas. Um, <laughs> so, you know, there, there is a lot to consider. There are things you can do to mitigate some of it. But to be honest, distance um, and time are the two big things um, that you have working in your favour. You know, if you own a home, you can get your wiring um, sorted. You can either get used cable wiring or get your cables wound in a certain way to neutralise wall EMFs. And you can also um, get like a bit of a kill switch to your house that um, is not doesn't include the circuit for the fridge or other essential appliances, mm -hmm. but everything else is completely dead so that your entire home is EMF free overnight um, I'm going to get my, know, my even, friend who's an electrician to listen, listen to this and he can sort the house out for me <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. it's a bit of an unusual request and if it's yeah. something that you know you need clarifying just call me um, <laughs> but it is a really useful thing to do um, if you own a home but know that if you rent there's still a lot you can do to Absolutely. lower your exposure in fact I know not everyone can afford a building biologist and I know um, some people are limited by you know what's going on in their um, in their home and are unsure what to do so if you don't mind me just sharing this now i'm actually absolutely my course um called emf proof your home mm. and it's designed to do 85 percent of the heavy lifting that a building biologist would have otherwise done for you allowing you to reduce your exposure by up to 95 percent doing it yourself and making changes yourself so i go through all six types of emr and the ways you can either mitigate, ameliorate, eliminate um, what's going on in your home and bring awareness to it. So wherever you can make changes, you can do so without spending any extra money. Mm. Um, and certainly if you want to go that last step, maybe you've got major health problems with you or someone else living in the home. You can then, when you bring an EMF testing technician in or a building biologist, you can say, here's everything I've already done. Yeah. Okay look for what else there might be, which will again save you money in the long run. So if anyone's keen to drop their EMF exposure in their home, that's, I think, a really nice middle ground um, Absolutely. that provides, you know, an, an educated opportunity to, to do, do that stuff yourself. Mm. Oh, amazing. Now, I wanted to touch, before we run out of time, I wanted to touch yeah. on... Um, the back onto the mold, yeah. So how how can we how, how can we remedy, remedy that? What what sort of other steps? And is it all dire at the end, or is it something that we can do something about? There's you can always do something. Yeah. About something. Okay, you've always got options. I think though. Um, what solutions are going to look like depends on a number of circumstances for people, um, including do they own or rent, and do they have insurance mm -hmm. if they own. Um, so if you, if you rent, um, currently the residential tenancies act does stipulate the property needs to be safe for human health and mm -hmm. human habitation. Mm -hmm. So I do work with clients to break leases all the time and get compensation, mm -hmm. but there are currently no laws or legislation to force a landlord to remediate it properly. Right. And if a mouldy, if a water damaged building has made you sick, sick, this is probably the most unfortunate thing. Even a medical grade double ICRC certified remediation sometimes isn't enough for that to make that house safe for you to live in again. Right. But I'll talk about what to do if that's the case um, mm. in the meantime. But as a renter, um, I mean, I'm a landlord as well as a tenant, so this mm. isn't a landlord versus tenants thing at all. But you cannot, as a tenant, um, force a landlord to re do a medical grade remediation. They might have other things that influence their ability to do so anyway, like insurance limitations. Um, and so usually you can ask, mm. but usually it's going to be a no. And so your best bet, to be honest, is to engage a mould testing technician or building biologist to do the bare minimum assessment you need to mm -hmm. prove at the tribunal and in a small claims court if you're going for more compensation that there was a problem and it's compromised, you know, the living environment and also your belongings as mm -hmm. well because you don't really want to make an insurance claim for your stuff and lose your 
you know, affect your premiums when it's someone else's negligence. I mean, if it's an accident or something new, that's a different story. So there's a few nuances, but basically as a tenant, you need to get evidence fast and, and not threaten them with a tribunal date, but book a tribunal date nine times out of 10, it's resolved before it ever goes ahead. So you just have to take immediate and aggressive action wow. and work out what kind of compensation you need. So mm -hmm. if they agree quickly, um, then you might simply need moving costs. Yeah. Um, and, you know, but you've got to have somewhere else safe to go as well. And this is the practical logistical nightmare that it, that it is. Um, but other times you might actually uh, be able to get compensation for um, belongings that have been water damaged and are unable to be remediated, remediation costs, dry cleaning costs, um, things like HEPA filter replacements for mm -hmm. your air purifier that has now been contaminated, stuff like that. Mm. So essentially your goal is to get to a safe home ASAP yeah. and getting out of the unsafe one is the number one priority. Number one. Um, if you own, obviously you can do whatever you want. Mm. And if you um, love the home and you want to stay there, then you can engage a double ICRC certified remediator to do a medical grade remediation, but you also need a more comprehensive building biology report in order to get the insurance company to pay for it. Right. So um, one of the key things about this is you must use the terms, the term water damage. Mm -hmm. Most insurance companies, if you check the policy carefully, will not cover mold. And that's because there are lots of occupant behaviors and environmental influences that you as an owner are responsible for that could prevent mold. And they don't want to end up having to pay for something that you could have prevented yeah. as in keeping the humidity in your home at the right level or ventilating your property properly, you know? Mm. So if you've had a leak, um, you know, the, the, there was a, several storms here, which, you know, has caused a lot of roof leaks. If your pipe has burst or your dishwasher's overflowed, um, any water event needs to be dried within 48 hours. Mm -hmm. And if you can do that, you're okay. But oftentimes that can be easier said than done, even with commercial equipment, if you get it in straight away. And then you're faced with, okay, now what do we do? And I guess that's probably what people really want to know. Like, can you clean it off? Can you, you know, can you paint over it? The answer to that is no, um, because dead mold is <laughs> actually more toxic than living mold. And so as it, as it dies, more mycotoxins are released, DNA fragments are released, which can actually make you a lot more sick than mm. when the mold's growing. But basically anything, this is obviously very general and a building biologist could tell you specifically with your stuff, but anything that's not porous in any way, shape or form like glass, metal, um, can be actually wiped down very easily and mm -hmm. cleaned. Semi-porous stuff is a little tricky, trickier. Sometimes it's recoverable, sometimes it's not, but anything porous has to be biffed. So that means um, gyp rocks, so plasterboard, so ceilings, walls, flooring. Solid timber tends to be a little bit more resistant to mold. So you might be able to get away with it if you were able to dry it in sort of three or four days. But otherwise, that's got to be ripped up. If it's carpet, the carpet's got to come out. The underlay's got to come out. The smooth edge has got to go. All of that's got to be replaced. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's other remediation um, things that have got to go. But be undertaken i should say but things that also means that if you've been in a moldy place for a period of time the mycotoxins and the spores are in um cushions cushioning wow. so yeah. pillows have to go on the bin your mattress has to go on the bin your couch clothing. has to go on the bin. clothing so clothing can often be recovered mm -hmm. um but it either has to be washed for an hour at 60 degrees with an mm -hmm. end like a fungicidal most of my things would not survive that kind of laundering. So then you've got to get it dry cleaned by a specialist dry cleaner. Now I managed to save pretty much everything I had bar two, like one silk dress and I think something else um, that was leather. And once it gets its high fee in, you just can't, you just can't get it out. Mm -hmm. And of course, in Sydney, it's very humid here. Exactly. Um, and so the minute the humidity is over 50, you know, well over, 60%, especially over 70, it's just going to spring back into life. So, yeah. yeah, but, you know, I guess things like books, 
photographs, art, all of those things are um, also heavily impacted. But this is where knowing your genetic susceptibility also comes into recommendations. So yeah, for someone who's not, next. yeah, so for someone who's not genetically susceptible, um, you can't you can't kill mycotoxins because they're mm. a chemical. But let's say you had a lovely piece of art or you had a book collection you couldn't bear to part with. You can the way remediators uh, fix it, they HEPA vacuum it, and that mm -hmm. actually means literally vacuuming every single page of your book. My very expensive. <laughs> very expensive. Yeah, and then and then they put it through a gamma radiation chamber, so they basically nuke it. Um, oh. That doesn't get rid of the mycotoxins, but obviously between the vacuuming and the and the irradiation, the contamination is quite low, and you can prop you almost certainly can keep that piece of art or keep those books and it's not going to make you sick. Mm. Um, for someone like me, I've lost baby photo, all my baby photos, all my photos of me up until digital photography became a thing. So I have no yeah. record. It's probably a good thing. I have no record of me as a teenager, <laughs> <It's awkward laughs> stages. but you know, I've lost, I've lost, you know, photographs of loved ones that are no longer here and textbooks and shoes and, you know, things that are, um, whatever you value, you yeah. know, potentially could be unable Lost. to be remediated. Yeah. Mm. Wow. So I guess that's one good thing about living in Perth. We have low humidity. <laughs> yes. Um, so lucky. So lucky, especially with water damage. Um, but it, so just quickly, and we are going to finish up very soon. Um, it's just, mm. I could talk to you on this for hours, but we won't. <laughs> um, <laughs> What's sort of the next steps for people? They've, they've, they've fixed their house, they've done all their bits and they know that they're sensitive or they've got the mycotoxin issue. What's their next step yeah. in terms of fixing their health? So assuming the home that you're in, whether you fix the old one or you're in a new one, is pristine and, I, and it would probably be worth checking that if you have the gene and you've gotten rid of all impacted um, possessions, um, the next step is sort of determined by whether you have the gene or not. If mm. you don't, you know, a lightweight detox with a functional medicine practitioner with maybe some lung repair, you know, immune regulating stuff, you're probably going to recover very quickly. In fact, most people, once they're out of mold, if they don't have the gene, will bounce back with that quite quickly without intervention. And so Amazing. often don't, don't pursue it. Mm. Although I think, you know, particularly with the gut microbiome and, um, mitochondria health it's probably worth investing in a bit of a tune-up but yeah. when it comes to someone with uh, with the mold gene or one of the mold haplotypes yeah you're going to need a lot of support mm -hmm. now i can tell you once i got into a healthy environment six weeks on the protocol i was on i was 85 percent better so it doesn't mm -hmm. have to take months or years if it's taking longer you've probably still got mold in your home or yeah. it's probably the possession or, or the home or both. Yeah. Um, but there's a very clear pathway for recovery from mold. Um, a Dr. Richie Shoemaker. I was going to mention. Yeah. Yeah. He established a 12 step protocol. Now he's an, an allopathic physician. And so his protocol is very much based on the toolkit that GPs have and their view of the world. And it's an excellent one, mm. but I also want to let you know, you can follow a naturopathic protocol that actually addresses the same things using other tools and recover, or you can use a hybrid of both. Now I never ended up using any of the tools available pharmaceutically, although mm -hmm. thank goodness they were there times where I thought oh I actually I'm thinking I might really need that mm -hmm. um, in the end I didn't. Um, but you know whatever way you go about it um, I think the tools that they have are incredibly powerful and effective and using a hybrid method I think is actually the ideal way to go mm -hmm. um, the only reason I didn't use uh, pharmaceutical binders was my cholesterol was already quite low yeah. and that would have caused further complications for me that, you know, over time might have caused me other problems I just really didn't need. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the later steps where they look at um, VIP and a few of those other medications, um, you know, that's still something I might consider down the track. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how good I might feel if I... I use them. Um, but for the time being, you know, I'm functioning so well, it hasn't really crossed my mind to use it, which I figure is a good sign. I probably yeah. don't need it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just know that there's a very well-established roadmap 
for people to follow. And usually recovery is fairly sequential unless you get re-exposed, which then mm-hmm. puts you back at step one, which is yeah. a bit of a bummer, but that's okay. Um, and there are plenty of people who've recovered from it. But like you said earlier, the hardest step is getting into or creating a, a healthy environment. Good environment and, yeah. um, and, you know, that's where I would be spending my money. Mm. Um, if, I w- if I was someone affected, that is your absolute first priority because mm-hmm. nothing else you do after that is going to help if you haven't done that very first step. Yeah, and this is why I guess the environmental questionnaires are going to be so important for people even far and beyond the testing because just figuring out if they've been exposed or currently are exposed is something that you need to take advantage of and maybe even just the gene types as well. I think that's probably the most important steps to start with, yeah. I think so too. Amazing. All right, Amy, I am so grateful for your time. Thank you so much and I'm not going to take up any more of it. Um, I would love to chat to you more and more and more about lots of different subjects, but hopefully someday down the track um, and even maybe still while we're still in isolation. (laughs) Yes, maybe. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I would love to um, pick your brain about uh, lots of other things because, um, yeah, I really value what you know and and what you've been through. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me, Jodie. Pleasure. And I'll share the notes and also where to find you um, and also your Instagram and Facebook and you're also involved in a, a mould uh, and environmental course coming up for biocidicals as well, is it? Yes, yes, yeah. it is. That's a um, practitioner training. So yes. for any physicians and health practitioners who want to learn more, it is a full and complete package that covers everything from the shoemaker protocol, naturopathic protocol, secondary complications and the building biology side of it too. So wow. a nice one-stop shop if you want to learn more. Absolutely. I think I'll be signing up for that. So <laughs> thank you so much for your time and I'll, we'll see you very soon. Thanks, Jodie. Bye for now. Bye.